Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of PhD Political Discussions. I'm really excited this week to be joined by William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party. Hi, William. How are you? Hi, great to be here. Yeah, very well. Thanks. Yeah, it's, good. it's good to have you on. So you joined the SDP in 1982. What was it about the SDP which you thought, yeah, I'm going to join this party? Well, I was very young at the time. Uh, I, I, I actually joined mainly because my father left the Labour Party um, and uh, joined, and he was a founder member in 1981. Uh, I was a little too, too young to join. I think I was 15, so I, I joined a year later when I was 16. Uh, but yeah, I, I was lucky enough to sort of see the birth of the party. There's a lot of rumours about a centre party emerging before it happened, following Jenkins' speech and so on. And, um, and then when it happened, I was lucky enough to go to some of the inaugural meetings. I saw uh, David, David Owen speak uh, in, in the Northeast in, in the summer of 81, uh, an electrifying uh, meeting and, and one which I remember to this day. So, um, yeah, I sort, of, I sort of was strongly influenced. Uh, you can expect, I suppose, at that age by my, 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 my parents. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, that was really the reason I joined then. And then I, I remained active throughout uh, the 80s. And a key, a key thing is that in 88, when the proposed merger happened, I was an Owenite uh, Social Democrat and I stuck with David Owen and stuck with the SDP uh, after the merger because, um, and we can go into it, but liberalism is quite different as a political philosophy. Yeah. From oh, that, that, was gonna, that, that was going to be my next question. What was it about the sort of liberal Democrats that made you think, I'll stick, I'll stick with the SDP, as it were? Well, it's, 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 it's quite a different political philosophy. I mean, it, the, um, I mean, to some people, they sort of lump um supposed center parties in 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 the same bracket but actually philosophically the liberals i mean culturally the liberals are very different to the labor part to, to the to the people that left the labor party and set the sdp up vast majority of senior politicians that set up the sdp were were, were labor and we're used to government and were serious politicians in a way that perhaps the liberals weren't really i mean the liberal party was no disrespect but it was more of a sort of protest group um, it also had um, strong pacifist uh, strains in it, uh, you know, West Country, very strong pacifist sort of Quaker thing going on there and so on. So there were tensions from the start, actually, not just at the top um, between the key figures, but actually in the memberships were quite, and I detected that in, in Durham, a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, Labour Party, ex-Labour Party members that were Social Democrats were not particularly keen on working with the uh, the lib liberals in Durham um, and 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 so yeah that there were differences and, and then of course philosophically there are very big differences I mean you know I, th I would say that social democracy is about the the group the the us it's more communitarian as political philosophy and liberalism is much more concerned with rights based and uh, you know issues and uh, individualism so there were always tensions um, and I think you know uh, the the way history's turned. I think we've been proved right. I mean, the Liberal Democrats now are in real trouble. We're growing, a bit very small, but we're growing rapidly. And um, the Lib Dems have have a lot of difficulty combining the three political philosophies that are part of their party into a coherent um, platform. And in fact, I don't think they can do that. You can't really combine social democracy, uh, sort of Gladstonian free trade liberalism, econ liberalism. And then the third strand they have now, which is sort of woke, um, ident identitarian sort of progressivism. You can't get a sensible program out of that lot. So I think we've been proved right. And um, in any case, it was the right thing to do, I think. It, 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 it is interesting, having been born in 97 myself, <laughs> I, only, I don't actually remember a time before the Democrats. So it's actually interesting to hear what it was like prior to that. It is interesting. Yeah. So, if, if, if you were to sort of lay out the current ideology of the SDP, and I guess quite broad terms, what would you say, what sort of party today is the SDP? Um, it's, it's uh, I, well, there's sort of lots of ways of describing it. You could, the, 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 the simplest way is patriotic left. Um, uh, you know, we believe in the nation state, and so that's the sort of highest level of our communitarianism. Um, I think it's, when, when describing it, I mean, the other, the other sort of two or three line where we describe ourselves is, you know, uh, left-leaning on, on economics, um, but culturally traditional and patriotic. That you know, that's the sort of the three-line thing. But I think perhaps it'd be helpful for a podcast like this if I explained how we the fit the strands of thinking which we take from eighty-one all the way through. And there are, there are three main strands which remain. 
and then the ways we differ uh, from that okay. uh, we've developed. So the strands, really, the, the being contra vested interests uh, is the big strand. I mean, the uh, people forget how completely revolutionary um, the SDP's breaking the mold approach was. I mean, you know, what they were doing in 81 was, was um, uh, contesting the, the actual basis, the vested interest basis of politics, very important. So they were saying something which hadn't really been said, that you can't get a successful program if you if you only bat for half the country, you know. So you're the incredibly revolutionary idea that you should govern for the whole country. Um, our politics is actually set up to be to reject that idea. I mean, if you vote conservative, you'll be largely voting for an entity that, in theory, anyway, you could argue the point, but you know, should look after business interests. And if you vote Labour, you're you're voting for the public sector unions, basically. Um, and you know, you know it, that that vested interest basis. A lot of people are comfortable with it, but the SDP's idea was that no, we, we should reject that and try and govern for the whole. And given the fact that one sector relies on the other anyway, it's more sensible to do that. So that that side, that idea of um, politics, is still with us. That's still absolutely part of our thinking. And uh, so the second thing that is still there is is a commitment to PR and breaking the mold because I don't think we're ser served very well by the the two parties, the duopoly. Um, and I think there are lots of reasons for this, but, you know, um, it obviously it's a bit technical with PR, but basically, yeah. um, basically you're, you're, you're blocking out um, contributions. You're, you're, you're putting a, a block on, on in, innovation in politics and you're, you're, you're leaving as gatekeepers the, the selection processes of the two largest parties pretty much. I know you've got the SNP and you've got the Lib Dems and other little parties, but but basically what, what happens in the UK is down to the selection process of the two large parties, which are coalitions anyway. I mean, let's, mm. let's I mean, they're coalitions. So you're, we think it's better to vote, uh, to vote honestly and then do your coalition building later. The system we have now is you, you build the coalitions in these red and blue parties and then you, you know, you put it to the public and, and the public ratify it largely. Um, so and the third thing that we we take from 81, which is still there, is the social market theory, which is basically the, the idea that the, um, the, the the public sector and the private sector are not uh, opponents, they're, they're complementary parts of the same society, uh, which it sort of follows from the vested interest thing. So those are the things that we uh, have retained and are very proud to retain. Um, there have been a couple of things which have changed over the sort of 40 years since we, we celebrated our 40th anniversary the other day. Um, the things, the two things, the two main things that have changed uh, over the 40 years is I think we we would be described as much more post-liberal now. Um, so the party, I think in re in reaction to what we did, what we'd uh, see as, as liberal overreach, both economic in economics and, and socially, um, the party is much more post-liberal. So much more critical of uh, rampant individualism, um, much more keen to think about what we do together. Uh, and so you, the, the sort of thinking you get in, in Philip Blonde's Red Tory project or, or Morris Glassman's Blue Labour project is, is basically our way of thinking. Um, and the, the other major thing is that we've become very, very Eurosceptic or EU sceptic as we describe it. We're very pro-European party, always have been. But um, following Owen, really, Owen's path of being a sort of Euro realist or an EU EEC realist in 81, Slowly but surely, Owen um, <clears throat> became more Eurosceptic uh, in, in 19, actually, this is when he was still leader, we, the Scarborough Conference of 89 resolved that we wouldn't uh, take part in the United States of Europe. And that was a sea change, really. And then actually, partly after the Maastricht Treaty and Lisbon Treaties, um, Owen's position uh, mirrored ours in that we became much more Eurosceptic. And I think by the time the referendum came, um, we were certainly on the left or centre left. We were uh, pretty much, apart from the Communist Party of Great Britain, the only um, Eurosceptic uh, voice. So um, that's where we are now. And um, I, I think the it's an interesting. I mean, if you look at our, poli our policies, there there are a blend of, of of red and blue broadly. I mean, uh, and I defend them uh, on that basis. And I think a lot of I, I criticise. Uh, both programmes, Tory and Labour, for being incoherent. I think a lot of people find it hard to 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 understand that initially that um, you know you can have 
policies which are regarded of the right or of the left on the same program, but actually it works very well in a lot of domains. That, that, that Eurosceptic idea really does interest me, specifically with the SDP, just because when you look at other social democratic parties in Europe and think of ones in Austria, Estonia, Croatia, there's quite a strong pro-EU, you know, ideology in there. So where does that, where do you think that Euroscepticism within the British SDP comes from? And what, um, why is it that? That's a really interesting thing. I, d I, don't, I don't entirely take the point. I mean, Blocker, it depends, certainly on the left, there are a lot of, I think it's true, what you say is true of, of the traditional social democratic parties, the SPD and, and, and most of the others. But they're the parties that actually electorally are doing terribly badly. Now. Yeah, yeah. They really are doing terribly badly. I mean, they've been routed largely. The only the only sister party that we have which is is doing well is the Danish Social Democrats, which and they have they've taken a cultural turn to the right uh, on culture, not on economics, um, and 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 would broadly approximate to what we're doing. And interestingly, as I say, they're in office. But actually, across the left in other places, uh, particularly Bloc of Scala in in places like Portugal. And Italian, there's one or two Italian uh, parties of the left that are strongly Eurosceptic, Greece, obviously. Um, so it doesn't follow that being on the left corresponds to a pro-EU position. In fact, it really shouldn't, actually, uh, if you think about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how do I explain our position as social democrats, but EU sceptics? I mean, if, if you're, if you, there's no, there's no problem of compatibility with being a social democrat and being a believer in the nation state as the thing that convenes solidarity and mutuality. That's, I would say we describe that as basic. Um, national health service is a national health service. And you don't, you know, you can't really achieve the solidarity and sharing unless you get that. You've got to have a, um, an entity which people are prepared to, to share in. Um, so it would, I would regard as fundamental, basically, if you believe in the sharing, and you want to, you know, center left economic program, uh, you've got to have an entity that you can do that. I mean, in any case, uh, again, very, very basic point. If you're a fully integrated member of the Euro, uh, you know, the five major policy levers are not um, accessible to you or your voters. I mean, you can't, if you're, if you're going up for election as a, uh, actually the SPD in, 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 in Portugal is sent, to, is sent to right, actually, but, the, but it, let's suppose you go to up for election as Bloco in Portugal, and you want to do something about things. Well, I'm sorry, but you're, you're, you're in the Euro and you're, you've signed the treaties and you have no access to immigration policy, to industrial policy, to monetary policy, fiscal policy, nothing. You can't touch them. So the idea that those things are taken off the table pre-politically, I, I would say any social democrat should be aware of, of that and should, uh, should re reject it. So, yeah, I think, I mean, it, in terms of the, the sort of, it's been an interesting journey for the Social Democrats in, in the UK because I would openly describe us as sort of Benite and Shoreite on um, on the EU. You know, and uh, as I say, it's 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 good that Owen um, is of the same opinion. Um, but there's nothing incompatible at all with being a, a Social Democrat and being pro nation state. I like guess probably a precondition. It's interesting. So would you still describe the SDP as an internationalist party, though? I and mean, you said you were pro-European. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Very, very, very internationalist. And it's that we, you know, you, you may want to, and viewers may want to, to have a look at it. We, there are sort of new family documents, I think, called the New, new Declaration, which um, was published in 2018. And we took a lot of trouble over it because we, I mean, A, the, the, uh, the SDP was founded on, on the Limehouse Declaration, famously, and we, we asked ourselves, the National Committee said, well, what would it look like if we, um, if we rewrote it? So we, we, we did that. Um, and it's, as a sort of second founding document, it's very important because it does, it does set out the reasoning for, for many of our positions in these things. So I would um, urge anyone that's interested to, to read it. So the other sort of big constitutional debate in the UK is obviously that of the union itself. And we're seeing mm -hmm. we're seeing calls for a second referendum in Scotland. Independent support in Wales is, I think, record. Like the ITV poll showed it was at record high, be it still only a third, but it's definitely mm -hmm. growing. What's yeah. the SDP's position on the sort of future constitutional arrangements of the union and the possible threats of its breakup? Uh, well, the, the, the fundamental thing is that we're unionists. Uh, I would describe ourselves, I have described ourselves as sort of lowercase uh, unionists in that, when, you know, it's not, if you're a Democrat, you have to accept uh, the, you know, a, a, a nation like Scotland has the right, if it, if it votes 
uh, to to secede, but um, but they've had the vote. <laughs> so our position is that you respect votes, and if you don't, then the whole of democracy is is at stake. Uh, same as the 2016 vote, you have to respect it. So there shouldn't be another vote for a long time. And the fact that the um, the, the, you know, the position of the UK has changed, well, you're part of the UK, you know, and, and the UK voted to leave the EU. So um, I think you, I, I think our basic position to, to in, in, in relation to Scotland is that we resist a second referendum. I mean, it's, you're looking at the 2030s and Johnson should just, res, you know, refuse it. Um, but, and, and I think, it, you know, broad, more broadly, it'd be very, it'd be a real pity um, if, if Scotland um, left the Union. I don't think it would be good for Scotland or us. I, I, I speak as someone who's um, mainly Scots by, by blood and, um, you know, and, and has a lot of family. I have a lot of family in, in Scotland and I have, you know, um, a house actually in Orkney. And I, 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 I think it'd be a real pity if, if Scotland uh, left, but, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. You can't. You'd have to. I mean, if there was an, if there was a referendum in the 2030s and uh, and the Scots voted to leave, you'd have to respect that. But it wouldn't be the end of it, of course, because I think Albany and Shetland might might have a, a view on whether it should still be in in Scotland. So once you once you unpick these things, it gets pretty difficult. I think the the position in uh, Northern Ireland is separate. And the position in Wales is is more difficult um, economically. But I'm not one that, um, I mean, I wouldn't, in, in counteracting Scots nationalism uh, and separatism, I wouldn't concentrate on economics anyway. I mean, I think that's, that must be the lesson from the uh, 2016 referendum. Uh, don't do that. No, it's, these things are matters of identity and culture and um, you've got to win them on those. I mean, you're, you're, the threat to the union really is the, is the uh, growing uh, disinclination among younger Scots to identify as, as British. That's the thing that'll cost it in the end. I mean, it, you know, I think it'll be extremely bumpy for Scotland. I mean, they'd have the largest PSBR and largest uh, fiscal deficit in Europe, pretty much if they left. And they do very well out of public spending in, in the UK, but they can do it. I mean, they're, you know, talented and resourceful people and they, they you know, you should, you should, you, you know, we, should, we shouldn't be arguing as to whether Scotland could be a successful state. Of course it could. That, that, that issue of identity really does interest me, particularly because of my own research, but just in general, I think it's really interesting. I think we have we have particularly seen, I think, not just in Scotland, but even in England and Wales, there has been a reduction, I think, amongst young people in holding on to that British identity. How do you how, how do you bring that back? How do you make people feel sort of, you know, pride in being British again? Uh, well, that's a really, I mean, you know, as, you, as you're aware, uh, a lot of these political questions are downstream from culture, and, and the, it's hardly surprising if you're cultural establishment um, demonizes Britishness, says, you know, we're not a force for good in the world. Uh, you know, the whole of the history is racist and, and imperialist and it's awful. Well, it's, don't be surprised that if you demonize a culture in that way that uh, people uh, of their own volition start to identify as something else. It's just, apart from anything else, just easier. I mean, I, it's false because the, you won't get a, a group of more uh, enthusiastic imperialists than Scots. <laughs> you know you won't i mean the, the on the history i mean scottish people now can say well you know i want to be scots i, I don't really like the idea of being british but you know it, british imperialism was very scots uh and uh you can't you know it, it's it's a little bit um it's 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 false to to try and sort of just buy out of it in the, in the way that, that they do but as i say it's it's lot i think the answer to your question is that you have to start valuing and speaking up culturally for for your own country, which is which is Britain, and um, and we must do that. But that's a much broader problem because the cultural um, establishment has decided to attack, and not just in this society. It's happening in the states. We get a lot of things from the states anyway. But has decided it's wise to attack uh, the foundations of the we of, of many Western countries and many Western values without actually. Uh, it's pretty pretty unsubtle, but without actually comparing the West and its record with other empires or with other states now. Um, so a lot of it's fairly flaky, but that's the project, but it's part of a much bigger project, again, which we uh, as sort of um, cultural conservatives, uh, you know, kick against because what, what, what we've seen is, is a very, very long range. I mean, it's not, it's not, you know, woke stuff and progressivism hasn't just happened. It's, 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 it's sort of 
you know, 40 years, 50 years in the making, and arguably 100, 150 years in the making, you know, <laughs> take it back to the late um, 1700s, you could, you know, there are, there are, there are certainly, um, there's a pattern uh, um, which could be traced from there to, 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 to uh, today. So, um, I, you know, I think, I think in many ways, the, the cultural, these cultural things are, are probably more, more important than um, any other question, because if you, if you deliberately undermine the foundations, of society, if you deliberately um, undermine, you know, I mean, I know, you know, organized religions pretty much, um, you know, been undermined in, in our country, but you know, you, you can't, you can't undermine religion, uh, the position of the, the family, respect for the nation state, and so on, you can't undermine the whole thing, and get away scot free. I mean, you, you there are consequences to these things. And uh, you, 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 in the end, you, you lose what we describe as a common culture and you're in trouble. So another big political issue, probably the big issue of the last, it's even more than a year now, it's incredible to think how long it's gone on for now, has been the, the, the COVID, the COVID pandemic. Hmm. So for, first of all, how, how do you think the government's response has been to that pandemic? How would you sort of rate it as it were? Uh, I, to be honest, I mean, we, we, we as a, we're, we're characterized as being a um, lockdown skeptic party or whatever, but in, we supported the first lockdown, perfectly rational to, to do what the government did. I mean, obviously, you know, hindsight's wonderful, easy, and, and they, they should have closed borders more rapidly and so on, but that's just hindsight. I, I don't, I think the government's response early on was pretty much the same as any other uh, government's response. And actually, no government, the people that were arguing for no lockdown at that stage weren't being very realistic because the only example they had was Sweden, which critically, Sweden's, you know, Tig Tigl and um, Giesecke, their, their experts advised their government not to lock down. So their, the, the Swedish government's policy was in line with their expert advice. Now, I mean, you could argue that Brazil's isn't another place, but, but in a state like the UK, if nerve tag and sage say lockdown, the government's going to lock down. So I wouldn't criticise uh, the Johnson government necessarily on that basis. I think there's been a structural problem in that um, the obviously the advice from the virologists and epidemiologists is there, but the, the the broader advice, the consequences of the lockdown, the cost, the the aggregate cost of the suppression measures hasn't been measured properly. And importantly, it wasn't a part of the mandate of those committees to do so. So you look at, you know, um, Ferguson. Ferguson says, well, it wasn't up to me to, to, to try and quantify the, the cost of the suppression measures. And he's, he's right. I mean, it wasn't. But someone should have done that job. And my, my broad criticism of the government is that they've tried to ignore or pretend there aren't any costs on the other side of the tennis net. And they haven't been open. And again, it's 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 you'd be quite um, politically unsophisticated to argue that they would have done this, I think. But they haven't been honest about the um, the trade-offs, the cost-benefit trade-offs that are involved in a policy like this. So they haven't said openly, well, you know, if we if we caught, if we lock down, I mean, it's arguable because the the efficiency, you know, the efficacy of lockdowns is not proven. I think the metadata later will show that they've been fairly crude. But, um, you know, if you, if you decide to lock down, you might save X number of lives, but the cost is Y, you know, and they haven't, they've never, ever, ever acknowledged the Y. They've never, you know, and, the, and, and a lot of the costs, if you look at the PSBR and the, the, the debt to GDP ratio, which has now breached 100 and so on. Now, that has, you know, an economist can work out the drag uh, anchor effect of that on future growth and therefore future public spending and therefore future health and well-being. Now that could be done, but they haven't done it. That's that's basically the SDP's criticism of the government in this pandemic is that they haven't acknowledged the other side. Uh, it's always been you just got to lock down and do as you're told. So, but it's it's a moot point now, Adam. That they, they they we're here, aren't we? So. Um, you know, uh, we'll see what happens in a in future inquiry or whatever. So look, looking to the future, and hopefully we seem to be reaching the end. I'm really hoping to get a haircut next week because <laughs> it's getting yeah. a bit desperate. So well, in, in, obviously in terms, of the, um, in terms of the economy in particular, obviously there's been significant economic damage for quite obvious reasons. What should the government do in terms of, you know, the rebuild of the British economy, do you think? Oh, well, that's a much broader question. Um, we, I mean, I'm glad you've asked it because um, the pandemic 
we're we're very very critical. I mean, our our, our economics is is quite left wing, really. Our, our, I think the record of I hate don't like the term. I tend to use econ liberalism, but neoliberalism. The the economic record on the facts, on the data, on the recorded data of this economic policy which we've had for 30, 40 years has been abysmal. I mean, productivity has fallen, um, uh, growth rates have fallen. Uh, um, you know, we've hollowed out major industries. The proportion of of manufacturing industry as a proportion of GDP has fallen. So you're you know, fairly fairly um, insubstantial service based economy now. And, um, you know, and, and we've been governed by people that think it doesn't matter, um, you know, what is made and where by whom doesn't matter. That's the that's the econ liberal um, idea. And they they all read. It's quite easy to understand. I mean, the Tory party is not it's not a party that's full of ideology anyway. So most of them are pragmatists. But the ones that do have an ideology, most of them are econ liberals, Hayek and Hayek and the sort of econ liberals. And so we've had this, and it's very easy to think to understand, but it's but it's not been very effective. I mean, just on the record, it's it's been really quite poor. And um, so uh, you know, uh, we've we you know we've we've got a, the pandemic arrives, and you've, you've the West has already gutted its industry, and um, you know Western governments are scrambling around for kit and for capacity. Now, luckily, the, the I mean, you've, you've got a, a little bit of a look at it now. I mean. Uh, on vaccines, we're lucky that um, we have, you know, top universities, and we're lucky we have productive capacity in Astra and some other firms. I think the Novavax vaccine is going to be produced in the northeast fairly soon. Now it turns out that these things really did matter. So it's been an, it's been a real lesson for econ liberals. This you you live in a world where you have your sort of fantasy world of global free trade, and then something happens, and they think, oh well, you know, uh, that's been a bit of a shock. Um, Maybe we should change our mind. I don't think they will change their minds. But just to, to try and answer your question, going forward, we would argue for a fairly interventionist approach to rebuilding industry. I, I mean, yeah, properly interventionist. We, we've argued for trade friction. We're, we're, we, we represent the 5 million people, the 17 million people who voted Brexit. We represent the 5 million who, who are on the left. And our version of Brexit was very different from Douglas Carswell's and Dan Hannan's. I like both of those guys, you know, they're good, good guys, but we, we, we disagree with them on the economics. And, um, and uh, you know, so we, we've been arguing for a long time for some trade friction. It wouldn't have, it, we'd have, I, you know, the, the deal we have, the free trade, the FTA, is, as much as it's worth anything, is not really worth anything. If you've got a, a, a 90 billion trade deficit, goods trade deficit with the EU, you, you want some friction to correct it. And uh, you want an industrial policy that is focused on, uh, reshoring um, and a little bit of import substitution, and the fact is we trade better with the rest of the world where there are tariffs involved. I mean, the 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 Americans, um, if you well, if you take the EU as an entity, that's the biggest trading partner. But the Amer our relationship with the Americans is interesting because we have a we don't have an FTA, we have tariffs, and we have a trade surplus. So, you know, that's that's basically what we would we would think is necessary, and it's really hard for econ liberals to to hear it because they think it's it's weird but in fact if you look if you look at the data and you look at what you're what you need to do for society it's not just in terms of abstract things like balance of payments and trades it's it's actually what you need in the industrial towns north of the wash you need some manufacturing back um and you you know to remove to remove the industrial wage uh from 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 places you know like middlesbrough and hartlepool and, and stockton and so on it you you move the foundation of the family unit basically and and you, you that's it's not the econ liberalism is not at all compatible with social conservatism it's a point i made earlier about mm. about the combination of policies you know red and blue policy is far more sensible uh and much more socially conservative and you know conservative party puts itself forward each election as you know they don't talk about the family at all in, in between elections <laughs> barely talk about it in elections but where they do, they pretend uh, to cast themselves as social conservatives. They're not at all. They're liberals, and their liberalism has, 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 has extracted a price. I think so. That's our that's our economics. It makes sense, and uh, it certainly could be done if you had a government that believed in it. That's the other thing. I think a lot of our problems are caused by indifference. Uh, you know, Tories particularly have been very very indifferent about who who buys. I say not just about where stuff is built, but who buys 
key um, British firms. You know, I mean, in a way that no, very few large states would do. I mean, it's the this idea that you know, mergers and acquisitions in the city. Uh, a quick buck on a on a on a, a an acquisition or whatever is is important. No, it's not important. What's important is sometimes protecting what you have and building it for your own uh, citizens. So finally, I want to talk about the SDP in obviously upcoming elections. You've got um, mm. David Bettany running in the Hartlepool by election. You've got Steve Keller running in London. I'm assuming you've got, it's just such a big, there's so many elections happening on May the 6th, it's hard to keep up with what's going on. I'm assuming you're standing candidates in local elections as well across the country. How excited are you for those elections and what do you think your prospects are for them? Well, you know, I should also say the Airdrie by-election, we've got Neil Manson, uh, hasn't been. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nominated, but yeah, but that, that's going to follow a week later. Uh, very excited. I mean, it's been, it's been brilliant. Um, membership grows all the time, you know, in the low thousands, but it's growing all the time every month. And um, it's very exciting. We've never had, for 30 years, we've, I mean, you have to go back to 1990 for a card like this. So we've got candidates, I think we've got um, uh, nine candidates for the Scottish elections for Holyrood lists, uh, as well as, as Neil and, and Adri. You go through every region, uh, we've got, you know, uh, local government candidates in every region. Some, I mean, the, the regions that got ahead in the SDP, like Yorkshire in particular, uh, have done incredibly well. I mean, it, there are some hotspots like Leeds, for instance. Leeds, I think, I think Yorkshire has about 40 local government candidates, which is pretty good, but there may be 45. But in Leeds alone, they have 28. Now, some people that regard, some parties that are regarded are, as our political opponents, like Reform UK, well, they have one in Leeds. Mm. So, I mean, in some of the newer parties, I think will be, will be very, uh, susceptible to the Lindy effect, you know, they're, they're very unlikely to last. I, I don't think, I can't see Richard Tice hanging around to get one or two percent for very long. Um, and in any case, their program is <laughs> Reaganite, that's right, economics is not is not very sensible or popular, I think. So um, it'll be interesting, but yeah, just to, to back to us, I mean, to have candidates everywhere, Steve in, in, in London, and, you know, we've got some really good candidates on the London list, you know, particularly the young candidates we've got there. Uh, very excited about it so you know we just it's it's a tough business building a uh you know grassroots political party um but we're a little bit different to the others i think i think the heritage we have and the thinking that the um foundations we have philosophically are much stronger than i think any other small party uh and a lot of our members are very proud of the political heritage we have and are very you know happy that you know if, if you look at it in historical terms be, you know, we are an offshoot of the Labour Party, and I would say, you know, Labour figures like Attlee and Gateskill would be would would understand our type of politics perfectly. So, um, yeah, that's where we are. It's very exciting, and um, you know, we're going to hope um, get as many um, as many votes as we can. I, I would say it's not; it can't be done overnight. I mean, we've contested two by elections under my leadership, one in Newport West and one in Peterborough, and they're pretty brutal. I mean, you get you're, you're up against. I think it's 15 candidates, 16 candidates in Hartlepool. It'd be tough. No, look, but, it's uh, a very long list. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. No, and I think that's partly lockdown based. I think there's a, there was a, and also interestingly, because you get about between 12 and 25 by-elections per parliament. And we haven't had one for ages. I mean, I think the Montgomery by-election was the last one quite a long time ago. So I think there's a head of steam. There's a sort of, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of candidates uh, waiting in the wings and then it all comes out. But, but, you know, we'll get what we can and and, and bat our corner. And um, one very important thing is we're not going away. And I think I've 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 said to members we have convened realists. I mean, we're I'm I'm not um, you know I'm very realistic about what we could do and how long it takes. And our model is the Green Party. It's not you know not politically, but but in terms of building a, a grassroots organisation, you have to have about twelve thousand members to have the capacity to contest 655 seats, uh, 650 seats. Now we're not there, but we're in good proportion now. I mean, you give us a few more years and we'll be there. And I think we contested six seats in the, in the 2017 election. We contested 20 last time. It, it'll be over hundred this time, you know, in two years time or three years time, I'm convinced of that. And, um, you know, my, my feeling is that by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be in a much, much bigger and better place. I wouldn't want to predict when the next general election is going to be. I know it's, I, I know it's, it's meant to be twenty twenty four, but there's always rumours about twenty twenty three, and with, with politics, you just never know, do you? It could be a bit. Of... I, I think it's really interesting. I, I, I think, I think, I think it will be twenty twenty three. Only, be, I mean, only because 
historically, um, the governments that tend to hang on, as you know from history, you know, Callaghan hung on, well, he's going to lose. I think he knew he was going to lose. Kevin Hickson, my, one of my colleagues in the SDP, has written a really good biography on Callaghan recently. Um, and, you know, he, that's the sort of bitter end you get. Same with Major in 87 and 97 you sort of bitter end now the historically governments that have got big majorities and are in head in the polls um they don't do that they always go early because because it's take it when it's there so i i can't i think it'll be in two years because i can't see either johnson or a sunak led tory party passing J may or june 2023 if they know they can win yeah i think um Bank blair was a good example obviously 97 01 05 William Clouston, thank you so much for your time. It's been really, really interesting talking to you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this latest episode of PhD Politico Discussions. If you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to give it a like. And if you want to watch more content like this, then please do subscribe. Bye, guys.